Uh, Bhavan, interestingly, a few months ago, we saw a progressive statement being made by Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ali Sabri, saying the PTA is going to be replaced. However, look at the last few weeks, what has transpired in Sri Lanka. A, a complete U-turn on the declaration of the high security zones. B, we saw the manner in which how public servants have been told uh, by the government officials that they cannot criticize the government on social media platforms. See, now we're talking about the Bureau of the Rehabilitation Bill. What is going on right now in the country? Well, Shamir, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a timely discussion in terms of the human rights track record. Considering that Sri Lanka is before the Human Rights Council in Geneva and there is going to be a vote on Thursday or Friday this week, um, so we'll have to see what happens there. But it's also an indictment in terms of what's happened in the last couple of months. This is also in the backdrop of, as the previous speaker said, we've had massive protests, people came to the streets, and there's been change to some extent in the sense of a regime change. But we also have the government making various statements making particular policy decisions. So you mentioned the high security zone as being an example. I mean, we issued a, a statement. A, a few Not just later. a U-turn, a complete disaster, I would say. You know, you establish high security zones under a law which is on Official Secrets Act. Now, you really ask the question, what is the secret in this high security zone? High security zones have been created in the past, uh, I during the war, and that was for particular security reasons as claimed by the then government. Now we've been in court on some of these matters and there's been some success where people have been able to go back to their land. So I, I, I want to keep that also in terms of the past, the history of high security zones. What happened in Sri Lanka in the last couple of weeks is that they created this high security zone using a very questionable law on official secrets. And then when questions were raised, many of us raised these questions, the government suddenly came out and said over the weekend that they're gonna revoke this high security zone, the Gazette. The question should be asked is why did they impose it in the first place? What is the thinking? Who is behind it? Now the president as Minister for Defense signed that declaration, but I think there has to be the question as to what drove the Minister of De Defense to do such things. Who is driving such policies in this government? Who is driving these policies in a situation where there is such a focus on the human rights track record? But it shouldn't be a question that we ask just during the Human Rights Council sessions. This is a question that's relevant at all times. So I think the high security zone is one. The Bureau of Rehabilitation that's before now, it's been challenged in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is hearing these uh, submissions today and tomorrow, so we'll have to see what the Supreme Court says. But that's also raises question is, what is the thinking of this government? This is also in a context where there was a regulation issued last year under the PTA on de-radicalization, and there is a stay order by the Supreme Court, again a matter which we went to court on, and in light of a stay order, the question is, are they now trying to bring in this law to replace the scheme and objective of those regulations. So what is again the thinking of this government in terms of rehabilitation? You also mentioned the whole thing about a ban on statements made by public servants. Again, isn't this going to the heart of freedom of expression, freedom of speech of public servants? Now this is all done in at a time where Sri Lanka saw a, exceptional situation where people came to the streets calling for system change calling for a change in political culture and we are now going back to the old tricks the old policies the transparency is questionable with all of these things who is accountable what is the objective isn't it repression in different ways the government is trying to do so you know lots of things i think we need to look at but this is also at a time where the government internationally is going to is saying that they're doing their best, give them more time, and then you see very questionable policies and practices on the ground. 
Bhavani, many people are viewing uh, the Ranil, Ranil um, Vikram Singh administration right now, uh, bearing the hallmarks of the Gotabe Rajapaksa administration when it comes to uh, gazette notifications being issued and complete U-turns being taken as well. But in your opinion, when we have when we have a vote that is due on Thursday, early Friday morning in Sri Lanka, in, in Geneva, with regard to Sri Lanka, why is it that the government is hell-bent with regard to tightening the human rights track record more in, Sri, in the country? So I think it goes back to who are the decision makers. So we may have a new government, we may have a new president, but I think the decision makers haven't changed those who were there last year or the previous year, who pushed through task forces, who are very hell-bent on emergency regulations, who are hell-bent on regulations under the PTA. Um, you know, that culture remains. The impunity remains. And the question of, has there been accountability or reckoning, real reckoning for what has happened in the past? During the war, post-war, and there hasn't been. We have really seen a situation where alleged perpetrators are in key decision-making positions, driving policy, and I suspect some of the things we're seeing now is driven by some of these particular same individuals. So if like, there's no change... Like who, Bhavan? Well, if you look at those who are driving the defense establishment, they were there in the previous government. Those who are driving the law and order situation, they were in the previous government. And I asked the question, has anyone faced accountability for alleged violations during the war, post-war, or even more recently, there's been cases against attacks against protesters. We made a complaint to the IGP and the Attorney General in May related to the violence on the 9th of May when there was sufficient evidence to investigate. Has anyone been held accountable? I don't think so. So the individuals making decisions driving policy implementing policy are the same we may have some faces that are relatively new and i say relatively because i think it's the same same but key decision makers are still in very powerful positions and it goes to the crux of the matter there is impunity in sri lanka so the whole issue you raised before about economic crimes being connected to human rights violations of the past quite telling in terms of the country that says they're going to do so much but hasn't really delivered no, for but the what people. What I don't understand is, Bhavani, we are now going to the international community with a begging bowl for funds. We are in a dilemma, we are in a crisis at this, uh, at this very juncture in the country. There's no question about that. Why are we still venturing into a, into a path that the international community may distance Sri Lanka? And, and this may result in even aid coming to Sri Lanka being reduced in the next few months, next few years. I and agree. This could have I mean, a drastic impact on the country's economy. Yeah, and considering the economic crisis, we really need to get our house on in order to ensure there is confidence among the international community that they can work with a government that respects human rights, re upholds the rule of law adheres to democratic principles, that's not what we're seeing. So it's really quite questionable as to which direction this government is taking.